Good evening and thank you for joining us for our final SIF 45 streams happy hour, all of which have been sponsored by the best neighbors you could ask for, Great Lakes Brewing Company. I'm Debbie Samples. I'm the Marketing and Media Director of the Cleveland International Film Festival. Our friends at Great Lakes Brewing Company encourage you to put down your phone during this happy hour and consider replacing it with a fresh Great Lakes beer. I am a rule follower. I'd like to introduce the amazing Kelly Parker from the Cleveland Hearing and Speech Center who will not only be interpreting for us during the first half of the program tonight, but she has been with us throughout the entire festival at all of our happy hours. Thank you, Kelly, for being with us again tonight. As we begin, we want to remind you to join us for our closing night film, Best Summer Ever, tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Eastern, and then be sure to make time to hang out with us afterwards for the live Q&A with the co-directors and actors from the film. And you can find that on our channel or on our virtual cinema platform beginning at 8.15 p.m. Eastern. And if you can't make it, the film and post-film conversation will be available on demand throughout the rest of the festival. Also, also happening on Saturday, April 17th, 9 p.m. Eastern is our live SIF 45 streams closing award. A slew of award winners that you won't want to miss. You can view the ceremony again tomorrow, April 17th at 9 p.m. Eastern on the SIF homepage or on our YouTube channel. All right, so let's get to it. Each night of the festival, our filmmakers and guests answer your questions about our films. If you're watching tonight live and would like to ask a question, just use the YouTube chat feature or on the right-hand side. Our moderators will ask select questions to the filmmakers and special guests. All righty, so on tonight's happy hour, we will be joined by guests from the comedic films for Mad Men Only and Golden Art. Now we'll start with a segment led by comedian, DIC3 News reporter, the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Mike Polk Jr. Wow, thank you, Debbie. Thank you, everybody, for having me. And um, I'm thrilled to be a part of the uh, film festival. This is one of my favorite things. I think it's awesome that they're pulling it off this year uh, in this um, in these trying times and uh, they're kicking ass and they're doing a great job. And I'm happy to be a small part of it, especially for a cool film like this. That's right up my alley because it's a uh, it's a it's a comedy film and it's a cool film. I, uh, I checked it out and I was very impressed by it. Pretty exciting. Um, it's about uh, if you haven't seen it yet. Um, I, mean, I don't know. I don't know how this works. Are they seeing it right after? We'll figure that out. I should have asked beforehand. Oh, this poor interpreter. I'm so sorry. Um, <clears throat> get ready. Buckle up. Buckle up. I can't. I can't wait to see how some of the things that I say are signed. I think it's going to be quite an adventure for everyone involved. Um, but we'll see. Um, this movie is about a legend of uh, the Second City and improv comedy as a whole. He's a mysterious legend. He's a person of uh, folklore almost within the improv community. Um, I did not uh, participate in this in that Second City improv committee scene, committee scene and stuff, uh, comedy scene. But I had a bunch of friends who did move to Chicago. Um, other ones who did it here. We had a Second City branch in Cleveland briefly um, during the heart of the Great Recession. That's when we thought that people might around Cleveland, you know how we love our improv. We thought that people might want to come downtown, pay to park and go into a gorgeous theater and pay $32 to hear highbrow comedy on a Wednesday night. I don't know why it didn't work. There's a lot of mysteries in the universe, but um, regardless, uh, you guys have heard of Second City, of course, if you, I'd assume if you're watching this, it is a uh, hotbed and a, uh, the birthplace of so many great comedic legends that you've known from Saturday Night Live and whatnot. Well, this guy was sort of the granddaddy of, um, of, of improv. He really is considered to be that. He's a complicated guy, um, and I don't think anybody would argue that he was a genius. And I had to hear about him from my Second City improv friends constantly and about what uh, an enormous genius he was. And it's, it does, it starts to sound like a cult. They It feels like he uh, he had a bit of a cult, but that takes a powerful personality. And um, it was pretty, it was, uh, it, it educated a lot of my friends and it made them funnier and smarter and better people. Um, and they eventually, most of them got out of it. And uh, so good for them. But this, uh, this guy's a really interesting cat. 
And I'm uh, not surprised that they made a movie about him finally, because it's uh, he's he's an interesting fellow. And I enjoyed the movie. And if you haven't seen it, you will, too. And I'm happy to be here uh, with the creators of that film, um, either two or three of them. Somebody was coming in late. I'm going to announce all three of them. We're going to see who shows up. And this that's part of some of this is part of a game, too. This is fun for everyone. Um, so please welcome without uh, further ado um, for from uh, the movie for Mad Men only uh, writer, director Heather Ross. Co-writer, co-producer Adam Goldman, and possibly cinematographer Stephen Poster. Yeah, we got him. The trifecta, fantastic. Uh, welcome, guys. Thanks so Hi. much for being here. Thanks for having us. It's exciting. Stephen, are, are you okay? We were worried about you. Absolutely fine. Okay, good. Well, the film looked amazing. Just so you know. Thank you. Um, but we'll, we'll get to. We'll get to complimenting everyone down the line. I'll I'll pay my uh, pay my due diligence to all of you. Um, so uh, welcome to Cleveland, sort of welcome cyber. Welcome to Cleveland, um, and uh, well, congratulations on first of all being in the uh, Cleveland International Film Festival. That's a big deal nowadays, and so congrats on that. Um, and how are you finding Cleveland so far? Anybody want to comment on that? I mean, Turn left to Chicago. <laughs> I hear you. Um, there. Yeah, I wish you guys could be here. It would be obviously more fun. And, uh, you know, next year, whenever you whenever this becomes a huge success, and you do your next thing, then uh, you'll, we'll obviously bring you back and we'll show you a good Cleveland time. Uh, corned beef sandwiches the size of your head. Um, you know, sturdy women. We got it all here. Whatever you need. <laughs> um, so uh, good. But congratulations on being in it. I really did enjoy the film. I've got some questions for you and then we're going to open it up um, to other people. Um, uh, who are going to be commenting in. And But before we do that, uh, first of all, why don't you guys just uh, each, we'll start, uh, Heather, what um, what compelled you to uh, pick this subject of all uh, to do a movie about? Well, it all started several years ago when I was in Chicago um, making a, a film. You know, I was doing sort of serious, straight-ahead verite documentaries, and I was um, shooting something in inside a teenage girl's prison. And it was a little dire, as you can imagine, and, yeah. and, and very serious and gritty. But the kids who were in there were freaking hilarious. And they made me laugh and they made each other laugh. And it made me start thinking about there's some function to this comedy thing that I've been obsessed with all my life that is beyond, you know, just like getting a couple yucks. So um, and around that time, I started hearing about, you know, the the legend of Del Close, this sort of Rasputin of comedy. Um, you know, he just sounded like a mess. And I thought that, you know, that there's a movie in there. And there certainly was. He is, and he was an interesting mess. And that's uh, one of the things that uh, would be intimidating to me if I were you guys, would be that this guy is such a legend. And as you know, comedy people, especially comedy nerds, we can be like, we're very brutal. It, we, it better be good. You know what I mean? Like, did you feel a certain amount of pressure? Because if you mess up something with De with Dell, then that's that's gotta be a lot of pressure, uh, uh, Adam. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think we were somewhat uh, motivated by and terrified by the idea of uh, pissing off some of our friends in the comedy community who uh, they're detail oriented when it comes yes. to the history of comedy and uh, yeah, we didn't want to cross them. Also, since they would be the, the most enthusiastic viewers of the film in, in that kind of fan service way, we just wanted to get it right. Uh, but also he was so full of shit that it was okay to be wrong sometimes. <laughs> I don't know. Heather I was actually, I was yeah. gonna bring that up. There had to be somewhat, <laughs> and I'm sorry if you haven't seen this film yet, but it's uh, because, well, I hope you have, but if you haven't, what you're gonna see is it is, it's um you know it's it's definitely a bunch of it seems like it's a bunch of different genres blended together in a lot of ways and you hit a bunch like you go back to the um the reenactments and then you go into more documentary stuff and then you have the art design in it that's it's just it's it's uh, i imagine that it uh and tell me if i'm wrong here i might just be attributing things to, to this because i that's what i saw but i imagine that you it sort of mimics the the mindset of what dell was supposed to be was that the goal You've got it all wrong, and I'm I'm out of here. I assume. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, yeah, absolutely. This is a guy who invented a new genre of comedy, so we, you know, felt like we had to, you know, break down genre in our um, film as well. And you know, 
that's where Adam and Steven came in so amazingly. Adam to, you know, just say like all the rules of documentary out the door with anything you think we can't do, let's try it. And then Steven to come in, you know, bringing like, you know, years of Hollywood, you know, movie magic to bear on our weird little yeah. <laughs> from scenes and, and making them come to life and, and, and um, you know, treating them with this, you know, gravitas and at the same time, just pure ridiculousness. Um, that's what we were trying to do. Steven, you did give it an incredibly distinct look. Uh, was this like anything you had ever worked on before? And were you uh, familiar with Dell before you started on this? I grew up in Chicago. Oh, okay. So then you were. I saw I saw the Compass Players, the original, uh, when I was fourteen. They used to have kids' days on Sundays, and my sister and brother-in-law took me to a little storefront theater, and I saw uh, uh, you know like Elaine May and Mike Nichols and and uh, yeah. Alan, Alan Adam Arkin, Alan Arkin, and uh, it just blew me away. And all throughout my time in Chicago and I, I, I actually started my career there um, <laughs> not so smart I left Hollywood to go back to Chicago after school and uh, because of a woman you know but uh, uh, and and I shot there for 10 years and it was constant working with the talent from Second City because they got cast in everything yeah and uh, I, in fact my senior thesis was an improv um, improv uh, uh, short that was done with the the then music director of Second City. And uh, uh, we, we just uh, did this improv walk through this warehouse, which turned out to be where Second City moved. And uh, sitting down at a honky-tonk piano and he did some playing and then he got up and walked out. It was a very cool. simple way of getting through my final, <laughs> my final thesis. So I, I, I had constant, uh, uh, constant contact with, with Second City people. In fact, uh, there's one living half a block from me who, is, who was the director of the Groundlings and uh, uh, started out at Second City in Chicago, Phyllis Katz. Okay, so you do, so you obviously, this was a personal thing for you then, and that, is that what drew you to the project? Well, Heather drew me to the project, and 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 George, uh, uh, the the editor, uh, uh, drew me to the project because I was friends with them. And uh, uh, George and I uh, worked on a terrible movie uh, called uh, Firefly. Is that the name of it? I can't even remember. Patrick uh, Dempsey, and um, it it just we became friends in in adversity, you know, uh, uh, because of you're that. really gonna you're really gonna lose the Dempsey heads here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, and um, uh, uh, and then I heard that uh, that that Heather was uh, doing this thing on on Dell, and I I couldn't help myself. Well, it looked beautiful. Um, Thank you, uh, Heather. You have a bunch of people. I mean, everybody's cameoing in this or stopping by to to give their uh, two cents about uh, Dell. What was the recruitment process like as far as all the stars you brought in and all these people um, from comedy that you got? How was that? How'd that go down? Man, it was just like bugging people is all it was. It was um, we had a friend, um, Matt Belknap, who is a comedy podcast producer, and he knows kind of everyone through that. So he, you know, and he was sort of intrigued by the project. So he just started reaching out to buddies and, um, you know, and then, you know, it was just being a real pain in the ass to a lot of people. But, We're you know, there were people who hadn't spoken about Dell before, like Bob Odenkirk, because he's not known yeah. as an guy. So we were able to get to, you know, by kind of winding out to some of the, from usual, some of the usual suspects, we got to, to include some other voices of people that we just, like, love. I did like um, that you did have some people in there who were not huge Dell fans and were uh, willing to say it. And I like that you included them, too. I mean, some people... Just weren't buying the whole Dell thing. That was Same important much. to show that side of it because, you know, there would be moments during the making of it where we were questioning ourselves what we were getting into, what we had gotten ourselves into. Did he sound, did he just sound good or did he really have these ideas? And, you know, was he just a complete flake, you know? Right. So we had to explore all those dead ends before. Well, uh, he was a complete flake, but, but that was part yeah. of the charm. 
you can yeah you can be a worthwhile complete flick yeah um, absolutely that's what i'm i'm trying to convince people of that all the time you uh guys though had to work or now be around dell for a lot longer in a more concentrated uh way than a lot of people did did you leave liking him more or disliking him more than when you went into this project i I think everyone's going to have a different uh, <laughs> answer. I ended up liking him more. And I think, you know, in a way you have to fall in love with your subject in order to make, you know, justify ruining your life and making a, a documentary. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think, you know, what he ended up being to me is I just sort of like grafted all my um, confusing feelings about the creative process onto him. He sort of became the embodiment of the creative process to me, you know, just all the, the like super highs and the crushing lows and the, you know, um, uh, ways that you mess up your own life just to do this thing that, you know, makes sense to you and maybe no one else. So um, I ended up feeling a, a great kinship with him. Adam? You know, there were times where, like Heather said, we, over the years, uh, we were going through transcripts of his eight hour rambling kind of cult sessions with, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we really got into his brain and that was fascinating, but also, yeah, there were moments where I hated him because he seemed like a, a rotten person. But then it's like Heather says, like he took, it's like he took all the, he was such an embodiment of, of a certain kind of creative spirit that was so risk taking and so kind of had no self-preservation instincts at all that like it was almost like he was out there doing it so we didn't have to right like, it's almost like a kind of like a mythic figure who goes through all the kind of rings of hell or whatever it is so that right. the rest of us can kind of just dip our toes into the first ring of hell or maybe into the second one so you can appreciate him and the effect he had on the community but you oh, don't so want to yeah. go on a long car trip with him <laughs> totally Right. The main thing is that also how many people invent a genre, a new genre sure. of, any, of anything. Like we were alive for a time, like, you know, as someone who is interested in the history of all kinds of art, that doesn't happen a lot, you know? Right, right. So that that in itself is fascinating. Uh, Steven, did you come away liking him or, or disliking him more? You know, I... <laughs> I know so many stories about him from other <laughs> friends and stuff. I, I actually like him. I think I think he he was definitely uh, genius in in a lot of ways and and uh, you know he had a nasty side and he had a crazy side he had a sick side uh, but he um, you know he shared his drugs what can I tell you <laughs> uh, okay we have a question here um, from someone who enjoyed the film uh, his name is Aaron. And he says, you have some hilarious reenactment scenes in your doc with some brilliant comedians. How much improv was there while filming those scenes? Anybody want to grab that? Um, Adam, you? No, you got, you got this. Oh, great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we wrote those to be as, to have as much improv. Basically the idea of those scenes was the Dell side of the conversation was going to be strictly Dell completely word for word off these crazy old tapes we had of him ranting at workshops and stuff. But then the other side of the conversation, all the other actors could, could riff and, and do whatever they wanted. So, um, you know, for some people that was, you know, just like ad living some, some, some new like laugh lines. And for some, like uh, the scene with Lennon Parham and Lauren Lapkus, uh, where they're at DC comics, they just mm -hmm. went completely, off book for like half an hour having crazy conversations and I could just watch them for hours. So, you know, the idea was to sort of try to create an, a, an improv form for the movie. And, um, you know, I, in order to sort of let his uh, crazy voice, I mean that in the most loving way, um, his, his actual voice, his actual words come, come through. Adam, did you want to add something? Oh no, I think that's oh. Spot on. Yeah. Okay. Well, Gene uh, has uh, an, a question for you here. Uh, Gene says, how challenging is it to work on a doc about someone with a big personality like Dell who tended to embellish his life story? Was it hard to uncover the true story about his life? That's an interesting question. I mean, how do you, how did you separate and how did you, what did you choose to show and not show based on, let's face it, he was full of shit in a lot of things. So <laughs> how did you like say, 
this is worth showing and this might have been true or that had to be there had to be some tough calls there. Adam, you want to start that one up? I think we took a kind of side route. We kind of somehow bypassed some of that. Uh, I mean, there were tons of terrible, difficult decisions uh, that went on with Heather and, and George's editing. I mean, just the, the shaping of a story that this, is this sprawling. Mm -hmm. uh, like every year the guy did something noteworthy and kind of almost like he was setting bombs off all the time in the culture. Uh, so. But he did this, one of these things was he made a comic book with DC Comics, uh, which, you know, people, DC Comics was not in the business of doing first person autobiographical, right. autobiographical comics. And he himself was embellishing his own stories so that they would kind of play in the comic book format. So by sort of using that as our way into telling Dell's story, it, it sort of allowed a little bit of, or invited, demanded a certain amount of embellishment. You know, oh, I think, I think I'm, 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 I'm watching I'm watching the the Hemingway uh, Ken Burns documentary now, and and he created this persona, and and part of the reality is the is the the presence of this this persona that he created. So it's the same with Dell, what he created of himself became himself. Absolutely. Yeah. And he had the ups and the downs that came with that. He was obviously a, uh, you know, mm -hmm. he, was, he was a troubled guy. Um, but do you think if he saw, I know this sounds like a, uh, like, a, I know how generic this question sounds, but I am genuinely interested in it. Um, do you think that if he saw this film that he would like how he was represented? Do you think that he would dig it? You know, I think he enjoyed a little publicity or a lot of publicity. So I think, um, he he he'd like uh, that that we were talking about him and and yeah. thinking about him. Um, uh, you know, I I I don't know, and you know, but I do know that I I feel a lot better about making, uh, you know, getting on the crazy train with 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 these guys and just like seeing where we went and and doing something really different than if we had made a straightforward historical talking head documentary about him. That I don't think that he would have liked and mm -hmm. you know and that wasn't what drew us to him to begin with so um i don't know i think he i, I think he would be amused i think <laughs> there's he'd be sad that we didn't get some of the um gro some of the gross grosser stories <laughs> in there that, that actually brings something up too that uh, I was also wondering. I know there must have been some things that you just did not share. Is there anything, and you don't have to tell the whole story because obviously you would have told it in the film if you felt comfortable telling it, but were there some things where you were like, we just can't include this because it will either, it will either hurt people's um, perception of him too much for the film or it's just not appropriate because we don't want to mess with his legacy. Was, was there anything like that? I will open. There's, there's a, there's a light answer and a heavy answer. Um, there's uh, the whole L. Ron Hubbard thing where we had a, a whole arm of the story that where he um, uh, talks about him being friends with L. Ron Hubbard when he was a kid, and um, and then we sort of use it to parallel how he did become that sort of like uh, larger mm -hmm. like cult figure. And yeah, it's interesting. Had some difficult, you know, um, things that go with it that aren't so healthy for the people in the yeah. call. Um, so that, that, and it was just, I think, you know, L. Ron Hubbard is strong sauce and, and it was muddying the narrative a little yeah. bit. So it was more for narrative reasons that we, we cut that out. And then, you know, his misogyny was well known and people talked about it and we had it in various cuts of the movie. And um, it was always, you know, that was a, a rough one of like, whether you, you know, take someone to the shed and, and right. let them have it, which he certainly deserved, or do you tell the story that's at hand? And, um, you know, I think hopefully we'll release some of the, the good gritty tell all stuff as, um, you know, uh, ancillary material when, when it comes out. That had to be a tough thing though, honestly, Heather, like thinking about how, you know, you, you want to tell the truth about him and everything, but how much of it was like, are you taking the times and the era into account? I mean, how much of that balancing did you have to do when you were talking about that kind of stuff? 
I mean, when you're talking about comedy in the 50s and 60s and 70s, I don't know that there are a lot of people who weren't and not right. a lot of great dudes in that scene, you know? Like, this is when the hottest TV show was The Honeymooners, where the punchline was the guy threatening to punch his wife into the moon once a week. Right, so right. It was, so there were different times. So, yeah. you know, and, I, you know, I, I had to really ask myself at a certain point, like, why am I doing a film about a guy who, who has a, a reputation for you know, not being great with women. And, you know, I talked to a lot of people. I talked to a lot of women who worked with him and there were a lot of different answers. Some people said, yes, misogynist, no doubt about it. And some said, no way, he was a sweetheart. He, you know, some, some of the fiercest feminists that we talked to for the film was like, that's horseshit, you know. Um, I think there were a lot of Dells. I think he was a fractured guy. I think given the choice of, you know, shocking someone or placating them, he would always shock them. And that led him to say a lot of stupid stuff that probably did hurt people. Um, at his core, I think that he, um, I think he hated everyone equally. <laughs> he would really like that quote, I think, <laughs> by the way. Um, so if you had to, right now, if you had to say one of the people that you tried to get in touch with that you really wanted to get on the record about this, that you guys reached out to and, and you couldn't couldn't quite nail down, uh, who would it be that you think you were really, really would have liked, think they would have had a lot to add to the story? Well, Tina, right? I mean, Tina Fey would have been great. Uh, obviously, just for the fun of it, Bill Murray. Uh, oh, Heather, yeah. yeah. And Elaine that May. I, oh, I, God. We got we yeah. got a very a very um, nice thank you, but no from Elaine May, which I will treasure always. But we what got Dave it? Thomas. Yeah, and we got yeah. lots of great people too. Yeah, and yeah. Dave Thomas was great, by the way. Like I I love, I mean that that was a, he was a refreshing uh, voice in that. The, so and he was I like somebody that's anxious to show up for somebody's documentary to uh, for a deceased person's documentary to talk smack on them. You have to like it. You have to admire that. <laughs> Uh, he was a frustrated. Um, Go ahead. Uh, I just want to point out, since there'll be comedy people watching this, that uh, Stephen Poster, our DP, also shot uh, Strange Brew, the Bob and Doug McKenzie movie. So no shit. The dude on the screen right oh, now. Oh, God, so, that's amazing. I didn't yeah. know that. I know. I, I apologize for my ignorance on that. That's fantastic, man. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah so, it was great. So then you've interacted with him, and you've actually probably heard first uh, firsthand uh, his, uh Thomas's opinion of Dell. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> well, did he get even more animated one on one than he did in the film? You know, um, we talked about it when we were making the movie, uh, making Strange Brew, and uh, he's he's he, Davis is, is tremendous human being. He really is, and uh, uh, he he had so many stories, and, and I you know we we interviewed him for a long time. Um, and I think there was just about as much as we could get in. Uh, yeah. With it. But Dave is, <laughs> Dave is, a, I mean, I doing strange brew. I laughed for four months every single day. It was wonderful being with them. Uh, this is my last one. I promise. This is my last nerd question. Did you guys reach out to Rick Moranis? I assume. Or, and he's just, you can't get. I yeah. Did I touch I on a nerve there? Like worked with no. them. Okay. Oh, okay. No, I don't think oh, he Rick, didn't work Rick. with him. No, oh, I don't yeah. think he did. All right, that that's good. I just wondered if he was, uh, if, because I want I knew that he was Second City, and I didn't know if he ever did any time with him. But that would have been an interesting one as well. I think he okay, what's the retirement for the Strange Brew? I mean, for the uh, second uh, the SCTV doc that's coming out. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. So, do you guys have? Uh, or, or, or do you guys? Is this it for you guys? You guys hate each other now? Or are you guys going to work on something else? And and if so, what is it? <laughs> well, Adam and I are writing a couple new projects, and if they um, go, we will be um, begging Stephen to to come back to us. I'd be begging um, to do it with you. <laughs> we had Good. fun. We had. So fun. you guys had fun. Can you can you give us a a, a hint of what um what the topic is one of them is about a literary hoax that took place in the 60s where um uh a group of newspaper men in long island decided to write the worst book the trashiest book the most sleazy 
sexual, disgusting book they could and get it on the bestseller list to prove how um, culturally bankrupt the country was. And they succeeded and um, they sort of tried to take down the, um, the lit stars of the era, the Jacqueline Suzannes of the era, but they um, sort of had another thing coming. So <laughs> I'll leave it at that. That's cool. So still by still uh, rooted in um, that interesting time period. And last thing is uh, I do like all of your stuff. Look, the time period stuff look great. Like everything, all those little touches and stuff. I really appreciated that. Just so you guys know. We had fun doing them. Now I'm, I'm done nerding out and we were already, we're done. Uh, we're, I believe four minutes over and we're bumping into the next people's time wow. and it's incredibly rude. <laughs> um, and I think uh, we're about ready to meet meet our next folks. So I'm going to transition over. But I want to thank you guys sincerely for everything. And uh, I love a uh, great, great job with the film. It was very interesting. And uh, thanks for the talk, everybody. Thanks Our so pleasure. For having us. Congrats. Great. And I'll thank turn you. it back over. Bye, guys. Thank you, Mike. And thank you to the entire For Mad Men Only crew. And a special thanks to Karen Schiller, who is joining us now from the Cleveland Hearing and Speech Center. Once again, Karen has been with us through the entire festival along with Kelly, and she will be interpreting for us for the rest of the evening. Thank you for being with us again, Karen. We wanna take a moment as we transition into the second half of tonight's happy hour to thank all of our special guests and our audience. And let's raise a glass to you because without your ongoing support, we could not be here to bring film home. I am also going to plug this Great Lakes Brewing Company Crushworthy. It is my jam right now. This is my last one. So I need to wrap this up so I can go to the store to get more. Please consider supporting your local nonprofit. And that is us. Please consider contributing to our challenge match to support the future of the festival. Our goal this year is to reach $145,000. And we are grateful for any amount you're able to donate. If you are able to donate, please head to clevelandfilm.org. And now we'll head into tonight's second segment, led by none other than the screen queen herself, SIF Artistic Director, Miss Mallory Martin. <laughs> Thanks, Sebi. Thanks for that introduction. I'm Mallory Martin. I'm the Artistic Director for SIF, as, as Debbie said. I am so excited to introduce our special guest from the hilarious film, Golden Arm. I'd like to bring up first Maureen Barucha, director of Golden Arm. Hi, Maureen. Hi. <laughs> Next up, we have Mary Holland, one of the actors in the film. Hi, Hi. Mary. Hello. And we have Betsy Sidaro, actor. And if I say that wrong, that's Mary's fault, by the way. You did it. You did it. Oh, my <laughs> <Yeah>. God. <laughs> hey, hey, Betsy. I think we're, I don't know if Dot Marie is coming or not. Um, there was, we were kind of maxed out on space in the studio. So if she was trying to get in, I apologize. Maureen, do you know if she's planning on coming still? Um, I texted her, so I'm, I'm not sure, but. Um. Okay, if she shows up, we'll we'll bring her in for the party. But, and thank you, Maureen. I know that it sounds like you're on set and, and quite busy. I tucked away in a weird spot. So I don't, you know, sorry for my, <laughs> sorry for my weird background. It looks nice. But, yeah, it looks yeah, nice. It you look got nice. trees behind you. It's, it's great. Fun. <laughs> yeah, you got trees, dude. You have trees. Whoa. What doesn't happen here? <laughs> I have a I have a house plant. Kind green. of. Green. Yeah. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. That's good. That's pretty All right, good. ladies. Well, thank you so much for for being here. I mean, this movie is funny, and and I don't mean like film festival funny. I mean like this is funny. But <laughs> so. Thank you so much for, for being here. Thanks for letting us share this film with our audience. I know they're gonna love it as much as I did. Um, I told Mary earlier in our tech check that like, this is the one interview I think I'm like a little bit intimidated on just because you're all so hilarious. And I, I just, I'm thrilled to meet all of you because you're like my new comedy idols. Whoa! <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> that was big, but you are. Oh, man. Be intimidated. <laughs> uh, all right. So, we're so, chill. We're chill. Man. We're chill. We're chill. We're chill. <laughs> I, I, I have to say, though, I, I really do think that um, the success of this film is in large part from, from the chemistry and not just between uh, the actors, but I think also the chemistry between the script and what I'm guessing was a, a certain level of 
of improv. Um, Maureen, I'm going to start with you. Can you talk a little bit about the script and, and what made you want to direct this movie and, and how you approached it to start? Yeah, I came on. It's so it's so. I mean, again, I love the story of this movie because it really took a it took a village and it took a long time. But I kind of came on five years ago, and the writers Amory, um, Allison, and Jenna Milley kind of had told me about the script that they were writing, and they were like, "We want you to come do a sizzle." And so I was like, "Yeah, this sounds so cool, like arm wrestling. That's like kind of like underground. Like, why not?" So we actually did a sizzle five years ago. Betsy was in the sizzle, and we they took that out and they kind of collected money and. Finally, five years later, we got to make this movie. So it was such a, you know, I was in it from the beginning and it was always something I hoped would happen. And with movies, you just, you never know. So when things kind of came together and Betsy was on and Mary, it's like kind of the stars aligned. And so it just felt like right. it was meant to be. Um, right. So it was five years in the making of this film? Is that Yeah. What? Again, wow. Emory, um, Emery and Jenna had kind of approached me about doing a sizzle. And after we did that, they went out and find fi financers. We did a live reading and then... I went to work at Kimmel and they went to work getting the money. And then finally, when they got the money, it was like, okay, let's do it. So we worked on some of like, you know, some little changes in the script. And then we kind of all dug in once everyone got cast, we kind of pivoted characters. And yeah, there was a lot of improv, but you know, whether it was like somebody on the crew pitching jokes, it was like every person on the movie kind of had their imprint. So that's what's so great. It really felt like this comedy village of people coming together to, to just have fun. And like, you know, that's what it felt like right. to me. <laughs> That's awesome. So Mary and Betsy, when did you two sign on? And can you talk a little bit about about what brought you to the film? Yeah. Yeah, yes. man. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you want to go first, Mary, or should I go first? You go first. You go first. I'll go first. <laughs> I'll go first. <laughs> um, because it was like, Maureen hit me up about doing uh, the sizzle reel. And I was like, yeah, okay, cool, man. And like very much for five years being like what it oh is that is it gonna be a thing because i'll i'm cool if it is you know but also being very like whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen and then it started getting like oh no this is going to happen we're gonna shoot it not in la we're gonna shoot it somewhere else it's happening and I mean, and I I've, I've said this a million times but like anything Maureen does I am down like as soon as she's like, hey, you want to do this thing? I'm like, yes, yes. I just want to work with her as much as possible. And uh, and and so it was that kind of this whole way through of just like, you want to do a table read? Yes, I would love to. Uh, yeah. And then uh, and then we had auditions. And I mean, Mary <laughs> is so good. <laughs> so good. And we performed together yes. for a while but it was just like so you guys knew each other before uh, right? yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah okay. we, we've known each other i mean i i've known i feel like betsy and maureen the same amount of time roughly i like i feels like a a decade yeah. <laughs> um, more. Uh, um, 20 years, dude. 20 yeah. years dude um and yeah, I, I, to echo Betsy, you know, knowing Maureen was doing this project, anything Maureen does, I'm, I'm absolutely in. And I got sent the script and I thought the, knowing that Betsy was attached to play Danny. And mm -hmm. so I was visualizing Betsy the, the whole time reading the script and I loved it so much. It was so fun and just such a great world. And I was so excited to get to potentially be a part of it. So yeah, I auditioned with Betsy and just, we lost our minds. <laughs> Had so did. much fun. fun. I mean, I think that playing off of Betsy, there, we, we have known each other for a long time and have done comedy together for a long time. So we were, there's just uh, instantly a shorthand that I think we had with each other and, and Maureen as well. Um, they're just very comfortable right off the yeah. bat. So it was, is just when it was going, it was just the most exciting thing. And honestly, it was like me just like sitting back and letting them do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I was like, I'm just more of like a regular, like, okay, we'll do another take of that. Let's just like have more fun. But it was, I mean, that's the thing. What's so great about working with Mary and Betsy is like, I didn't have to do a lot. <laughs> like, right. In the sense of like, you know, what I what was so great was we would talk about characters and we talk about the scene and then, you know, you kind of let them do their thing and then you find little magic along the way. So it's just like hard yeah. to magic in scenes, you know. It was, it was well, not work. 
<laughs> right. I mean, that's and that's the chemistry I was talking about. I mean, people always talk about chemistry among romantic leads, but I think like that's this is such a clear case of that happening among lots of characters. It, yeah. So can so I feel like you guys were saying because you knew each other for a long time too before. Can you talk about the level of improv that you were doing in the script and like how how that because I feel I mean I just there were so many scenes that I was watching along the way that I felt like, I, I, I mean, I know the script was so good, but I, I mean, like, Dick Tales, woo, like, that had to <laughs> oh be improv, God. right? That was, <laughs> I didn't think that would get in the movie. <laughs> oh yes. I'm so <laughs> bad at this movie, because it was, funny. like, my <laughs> favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> it's genius. I mean, it's so good. Just, uh, like, Mirror and Bits, maybe you guys agree. Like we did kind of different different levels and different ways of it. Yes. Yeah. You know, oh. sometimes we would talk about a scene before we do it and we would not like you guys would, you know, we would talk it out and improvise it that way. And then sometimes it would <laughs> yeah. be like, you know, there was there's you know, certain scenes where we're like, you know, let's let's just totally improvise this scene. Like it was mm -hmm. kind of like a, you know, a little bit variation on depending on the scene. Right. Yeah. I I also I loved what I love so much about this project in addition to like getting to make a movie with all our best friends was that Maureen really set up this environment where it felt so collaborative and so much like like she pulled us in as actors and was like what do you think of this scene what what do you think that the journey is for this character happening here and it was always a conversation um so there even if you know we were we were doing a take that was like let's stick to the script, there was still a feeling of, of playfulness about it that I think, yeah, kept it spontaneous. Yeah, because we would like almost before every scene, we would like hang out in the hair and makeup and just figure out like, oh yeah, what is, what are, yeah, what's, what's driving both of us? What's the yeah. goal of this scene? Um, and it just, it was so, once again, that comforting where as soon as everything started rolling, I was like, oh, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. I know, which doesn't happen all the time. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, for sure. But where there was just such a level of comfort and, yes. and I guess just, yeah, knowing exactly um, who our characters were. And, and yeah, it was, it was, Oh, it was great. <laughs> I, mean, I, uh, I think of it too. Like I always think of it like you're you're tethered you're tethered to a script, right? You're the script is the thing that's going to get you from point A to point B, and like right. we can we can float away, but we're tethered to that script. So when we need to, we can float back. We have a solid road ahead, and so yes. we can take a detour. But as long as we're coming back, and so it's kind of my job, or I felt like it was my job, to let them kind of go wander or like go find some stuff, but then. When we thought we were going too far, we would come back. So it, you know, <laughs> able to. Maureen was very back. good at being like, "Let's uh, let's, let's get, get away to, from uh, cow testicles. Let's get away." Yeah. I guess we did a, a whole bit on cow. We stuff. did. Oh, I, I, I <laughs> thought for that. Yeah. I, I mean, well, at some point, we're gonna have this cow clip. Uh, clip. I'm gonna have to be a real special. Clamoring for it. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I. What was I gonna say about that? There's also like a feel, a real feeling of um, with in establishing a relationship like Danny and Melanie's, where they've been best friends for so long. The get, being playful and like establishing that dynamic. Sometimes you do have to go beyond like what is on the page, just because what's on the page is so. I, it's very intentional and very like the real estate on the page is so precious and so mm. having the room um in the actual shooting to like for betsy and i to riff off each other and play and like really get into the dynamic of these yeah. two friends um even if you don't see all of even if you don't see all the the calculate stuff <laughs> hey it it informed <laughs> it informed the scene in some in some way so yeah. <laughs> Another thing that was really great and organic, and I, I feel like it does show in the movie, is that as we went along in the movie, you know, it actually ended a little bit differently. In the original end, um, Melanie's character kind of goes off with the guy, and she oh. they kind of separate. But as we were filming the movie, you know, one, it just felt like we were actually on this road trip, and like, you know, I was falling in love with these characters or, and Mary and Betsy again, so dynamic together. So 
as we went along, we're like, no, we're making this movie of these friends finding each other and being back in love with each other. Like they have to stay together in the end. We can't, you know, so yeah. that just yes. really came out of like filming the movie where we're like, no, we can't separate again. Like, like no, they, they are the love them. story. They I are. Think. And yeah. I love that you say that because like there was, um, I wrote down a note the first time I, I watched the film too, because there's a scene in particular. Okay. So Mary, when you come out as golden arm officially, mm -hmm. right. And you're looking all sexy and <laughs> nor <laughs> normally Thank in every you. other movie, right. When you come out in your golden swimsuit, yeah. they would cut to the guy's reaction. Right. But you didn't Maureen. And I loved that so yeah. much because I just thought that was like so different because she didn't come out for Greg, like she came out like that for her, for Mel. Mm -hmm. And I loved that so much. And I think that that was like such a, you know, I mean, I felt like the whole, the whole film is just like a, you know, feminist arm wrestling movie. But to me, that was such a clear point of a woman being behind the camera too. And so I just, I loved that. And I love that you're totally right. It is a love story between Mel and Danny. I mean, Greg's adorable. Like, I oh, love oh, Eugene course. Cadero, too. Oh, he's the best. He's the best. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you so, pass Eugene, you're like, you know everyone's going to fall in love with him anyway. So you're like, yeah. right. like yeah. that's, he's going to be he's the, But like, so yeah, so it's great that, you know, I mean, there's romance in the film, and that's a totally great layer that I think the story needs for sure. But it's a backseat, you know? Like, yeah. it's really yeah. about Mel's story, Mel and Danny's story. So I love that. I love that. But too, because it was, I think, like in that scene in particular, when she comes out, she goes and hugs Danny first. Like he's mm -hmm. there, excited to see him too. But they've been right. on this journey together, so yeah. It, right. it, to me, like the whole thing was like, I love that it's in there, but it, was, it is kind of like a story, like show don't tell. So right. we're never gonna say like female empowerment or like that kind of thing. We're gonna just intrinsically show it in our bones. So I'm glad right. that I'm glad that that comes across. Yeah, for sure. Well, so talking about Eugene, let's talk more about casting because I mean, come on, <laughs> like besides besides Betsy and Mary and, and Dot Marie jo Jones, who like I also have a question about too. Um, I don't want to make sure we come back to her, but there were so many great cameos like in this film too, from from Don, who I'm from Greener Grass, who you know we played Greener Grass. Don and Jocelyn were both at, at Cleveland, which was amazing. Ooh. Um, just like so incredible. Uh, and then who else? Kate Flannery, a part in Anturla, Olivia Sambuia is fucking Brenda, who I mean, like just is comedy gold, right? Like, can you talk a little bit about how you got all these people and, and sign, how they all signed on to the film? I mean, honestly, most of the people, I mean, I would say the majority of the people are like that I'm just fans of and that I've worked with before. So again, it was the kind of thing where I'm like, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna spend 20 days making a movie, I wanna put together one, all the people that I love hanging out with, two, the people <laughs> that are just gonna make me laugh. So yeah, it was kind of like, you know, Ron had done stuff with me before and like my brother Ahmed and like, yeah, and Dawn. And, so the first, you know, it was just kind of like collecting our friends. It's like, who do we wanna like spend time with? Hang out in Oklahoma, get sweaty in a weird cab <laughs> with like, just like the funniest people you can find. And so part of the casting too was like, I think it's like flipping the script a little bit and giving a chance to see people in a different way that you've never seen them. So I feel like everybody in the movie got to play something that they don't normally get to play. Right, except for Dot Marie Jones in a way, who <laughs> yeah. actually is an arm wrestling <laughs> yeah. champion. Um, can't, and yeah. uh, you know, I'm I'm bummed that she can't be here tonight, but you know, she's just incredible. And I think, um, like, I almost forgot when I first saw her in the film. I was like, but then as, as soon as she went into that character too, I'm like, oh right, like she just knows all this shit already yeah. too. So like, can, did you know from the beginning that like you had to have her in the film? Like, how did she come into it? Well, what happened was that she was always on my list because I'm such a huge yeah. rock fan. And then Don Luby actually was the one that was like, you know that Dot's like a real arm wrestling champion. And as soon as she said that, I was like, well, she has to be an executive. Like, <laughs> like there's no other person of cross section of arm wrestling and acting that exists. It's like, it is Dot. <laughs> so it was like, you know, giving her a call and just telling her how much we wanted her to be in the movie. and. You know, it was, it, I, again, I think the movie feels so real and we're so blessed that she was in the movie because she's, she is, and she taught us and it just adds a layer of believability and realism that right. nobody else could have brought. Yeah, she yeah. taught us everything about arm wrestling. Everything. <laughs> Every single thing. Are Are the, is it, go ahead. Yeah. No, 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 you go, Mally. I was going to ask, is the strap 
real? Is that a yeah. real thing that happens? Yeah. Oh. yeah. Yeah. And she, she was terrifying stories about that too. Um, yeah. I mean, we, fortunately too, that the, the whole sequence with, with big sexy was the very first week of shooting. So we like, we <laughs> thankfully got all that training before <laughs> we did all the tournament footage because it was, it was so valuable. I mean, I, I don't know what we would have done without Dot Marie. It's great. Yeah, we would have been a good. laughing stock. We would have been <laughs> laughed. We would have humiliated. Humiliated. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have one question uh, from the audience coming in from Jean. She wants to know if there's any chance of a Golden Arm sequel in the future. <gasps> Ooh. I thought like, like that was a well joke that it would be like, you know, they'd go to Russia or Europe. Like, that's where you have to go with the same <laughs> <That's sequel>, you know? <laughs> That's it. The Euro trip Take version. Take the big rig to Russia, baby. That's it. Yeah, or we like, somehow the big rig turns into a time machine. Yes. And then we like travel through time and have to only get back through. Our, like we stop like, we stop like the Crusades. I don't know if they're bad or not. It's like an army. Are we just doing like army of darkness? <laughs> Ripping off yeah. the army of darkness. Yeah. Army, I, I army think we could also do like of darkness. darkness. I want to see Golden I Army of the Darkness. College year, the car college years. I feel like oh, from the last year yeah. we have in the movie. I want to see the college years. Like so prequel. I want to go prequel. That prequel. prequel. That would be fun. That was on my list to ask you about because those that scene was incredible too. And I totally want to go see you guys in college. I think I think we need a prequel and a sequel for sure. Yeah. <laughs> this is really the middle. Yeah, this I think the number two. Disney is gonna buy us out, and then we're gonna have TV shows. We're gonna have a movie every six months of like, oh man, we gotta see like when Mel was in baking school or whatever. I also, <laughs> actually, this, I think also spinoff because like on set we joked that like Don's character and Ahmed's character had a secret romance. Oh, yes. So like yes. in the background of the movie, they are like Ahmed was like. I want to keep giving her treats. So, like in the background, if you see at the end, he's giving her like a cookie and like treats. So, like there's a, there's, a, there's a spin off of them. They're definitely a hundred percent. And I I don't know if everybody caught this before, but Ahmed's your brother. Yeah. Too right. Yeah. yeah he's hilarious. a stand up and actor and a com comedian in his own right. So I I forced him to come be in the movie. So funny and. And I love that you just brought that up because when I was watching it again recently, I saw him in, in Don's character like at the very end and they were like eating a fruit roll up or something. And I was like, I was like what are, what's happening back there? And it made me think too about like people in the background, you know, when you're just, it, it just like standing in, like what kind of conversations do you have to like try to keep it seeming real? And I just, I, I loved that so much. So I would love to see a spin off of them. Yeah, I gotta say well, too, our, sure. our extras in Oklahoma, like, what a great bunch of people! Like, they so rule. excited to be there in a hot, hot room, like, and they were doing their own things. Like, I feel like everybody was so excited to just be in the background, and I feel like some of the people in Oklahoma, the background actors, have been texting me, be like, "I saw myself in the trailer," and I'm so excited for them to see themselves in the movie. That's, cool. That's great. Yeah. yeah, me too. And so this this will be coming out eventually, right? I don't know. April thirtieth. Okay, April thirtieth. Available on Apple every... TV, digital, and select theaters. Awesome. Select. Yeah. Select. <laughs> it's really exciting, though. Okay, so there's a couple other questions we have before we let you all go. Um, so one of the questions we have is for Betsy. Did you actually get to drive a semi-truck? Whoa, dude, I wish. I couldn't handle that. <laughs> it's like, it, it's like, Got the biggest, like, it's like a ski pole size shifter. And there's like, I feel like 27 different like gears to get into. Yeah. <laughs> but we did get to cruise on one on a, on a truck, which felt awesome. It did. Yeah. And we got to honk the horn and like, we got to do what we, it was cool. We, it was we awesome. toot tooted. We toot tooted. I don't know. All over. We toot tooted all over. I don't know how, I don't know how they did do it <laughs> like it's the craziest biggest thing in the world but i do i i did not but i kind of did that can be on your bucket list i feel like that's a good bucket yeah. list item. i'm gonna start taking yeah. classes i'm gonna start taking classes get one drive it around la That'd be good <laughs> that's 
great. Um, all right, so I, I can't let you all go either without asking you a little bit about the different personas and the costumes, because I feel like that would be oh, such yeah. a fun part about making this movie. Oh, so yeah. like how, first of all, personas, because there's some really good ones in there. Um, like how did those were those in the script already, or did you guys make some of those up along the way? You know what they some were scripted, um, but okay. you know some of them were like I I think when I came on I added the breadwinner, and then like you know certain character like Dawn's character I think her character was written to wear a different costume, but in her <laughs> tape she wore a backwards hat and and guards on her wrists, and I was like okay her character is now a skateboarder. You know, <laughs> same thing with like Brenda. Like I, I kind of imagined her. I think she was a different persona, but I was like, oh, I love Tina Turner and like Mad Max. Let's have like a Mad Max type of like vibe. So, and a part of when she came on, I was like, what is like some of your dream costumes? <laughs> I'd love. I was like, do you want Sea Witch or like I would love to be a Sea Witch? And I want to wear a blonde wig. Like Sea Witch. Sea <laughs> Witch. It was a little mixture. It was like you know what what have you always dreamed doing? And then you know even with like Freaked Out Mary, I feel like it was you know, kind of yeah. coming together, seeing what that would be. And it was really yeah. fun. Yeah. And the, the montage of trying on things and then Betsy and I just riffing on what <laughs> those personas could be was was a rip, very fun <laughs> night. So was, I would just <laughs> try on and step out and Betsy would be like, you're this person. <laughs> oh, my God, the ex-wife. The ex-wife was my oh, favorite. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that could have stuck. That, that yeah. could have stuck. But stuck. honestly, like, um, you know, our strong. costuming, our costume were so amazing because of Jack and Geneva. Yes. And the movie really, I mean, is elevated because, and they, we found them in Oklahoma. So they did such oh, an incredible cool. job and brought them to life. That's awesome. That's fun. Everybody we have, was so good. So good. In Oklahoma? <laughs> yeah, so everybody, yeah, everybody, yeah, everybody was so rad. It what was made you guys go to Oklahoma? What made you shoot in Oklahoma? I think it was like tax incentive and then also like just yeah. a different vibe. Like everybody shoots in Atlanta and you're like, you've seen that, but it was just a different flavor. And I'm so it, glad that we went because it, the movie has a different yeah. texture because we were in a new place. And it was right. like, we're, we were off route 66. Like it feels <laughs> like you're like, it's such a nice road trip uh, vibe to it. Like you just yeah. feel, it really does feel so special because it, it was in Oklahoma. For sure. Um, okay, we have a question from Jeremy, and this question's for Mary. I really enjoyed your work in Greener Grass, Happiest Season, and of course, Golden Arm. What is on the horizon for you? Actually, that's a question for all of you. Yeah, um, what's on the horizon? Um, who's <laughs> to say? <laughs> um, well, Bethy, Maureen, and I actually, while we were shooting Golden Arm, we talked about, because we were having the time of our lives working together, and so we talked about writing something together, and we have been working on a horror movie. <gasps> so uh, so hopefully, Fun. <laughs> to, to do that. That's we're going to make it soon, and it's going to be so scary. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the, just been writing a bunch and I, I'm doing this Netflix show. I'm not sure when it's coming out, but it's called The Woman in the House. And it's a very fun sort of thriller kind of genre -y type limited series for Netflix. So that will be okay. coming to your screens soon. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> oh my God, I'm so excited for the <laughs> for the horror film. Oh God, can't great. wait to make yeah. <laughs> yeah, we All right, I know. have Yeah, I bet. I, I have one final question for you guys. And I don't think you're gonna be able to answer it, but I'm asking it anyways, which is who wins the arm wrestling match at the end of the movie? Oh, oh my God. We both shatter our arms <laughs> to the point where we can never use them again. We can't use them again. <laughs> and then we and then we shat our pants. Oh yeah, we shattered our arms and then we shattered our pants. <laughs> we shattered our pants. <laughs> and then we just called it a day. We were just like, it's oh, a, it's a past tense just... of shat. It's I shat. actually think even shat when we yeah. shot it, we had a tie. We shot we never shot anybody winning. Really? No. Yeah. It was always the tie. It was always just the tie. I feel I like think... that's how it has to end. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, All right, man. ladies. Well, thank you so much for for hanging out with us tonight. Thanks for sharing this film with us. Please, uh, you know, we'd love to keep in touch with you. We'd love to bring you to Cleveland in person next time. With oh, yes. Um, yes. You can yes. drive a semi truck here. Well, thank you so much. Yes. Right. 
<laughs> I'm a part in Cleveland so bad. <laughs> Me too. All right. Thank well, you for well, having good. us, Mallory. Of course, of course. You guys are always welcome here. So, so good luck with everything. Um, be safe. Hopefully, Maureen's okay. I think <laughs> you just got yes, sure off the balcony. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your questions, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Bye. Uh, well, with that, thank you to everybody else for joining us for tonight's happy hour. Thanks again to Great Lakes Brewing Company for sponsoring our happy hours. Uh, tune in tomorrow night at 8.15 Eastern for a live Q&A session with guests from our closing night film, Best Summer Ever. You can watch it immediately following the film on the Sift Streams app, um, the Roku or Apple TV apps, or if you're watching on the Sift Streams platform on your computer, you'll be able to watch it there, or you can watch it on the Sift YouTube channel as well. In the meantime, please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep watching films. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>